Well, good morning again. It's great to see you at North Creek Church. I'm so excited. I got a, a simple message. We'll get you out of here. Uh, it's a beautiful day. But um, one more thing that I did not pass on to Pastor Chris, so he didn't know this, but um, there's a person that just wanted you to know that money should not be an issue for you guys not to come on the camping trip. And so let me know. There's some scholarships available. Well, we are uh, going through the book of James, and uh, that's been just a fun book. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been challenged. I continue to be challenged even in what I'm preaching today. And so I'm going to dive in, but I want to uh, start with some, a little bit of humor here. Um, this is a real ad, okay? These are not made up. This is a real ad from 1916 that said it was healthy to give Blatt's beer to infants, okay? So I know it's a very small script. Let me read it to you. A case of Blatt's beer in your home means much to the young mother, and obvious, obviously baby participates in its benefits. The malt in the beer supplies nourishing qualities that are essential at this time, and the hops act as an appetizing, stimulating tonic. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready for the next one? Cocaine tooth drops. 1885. They are advertised for children, which you're like, really? Are you serious? You may not know this, but cocaine wasn't made illegal until 1914. So just a little bit of uh, trivia there. And I saved the best for last. Are you ready? To help you lose weight, sanitized tapeworms. Mm, yeah, come on. This, this is from the late 1800s. It encourages people to manage their weight by eating sanitized tapeworms. Now, the reality is it's probably effective, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, in fact, we have some in the lobby, and we just wanted to bless you. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I do not recommend eating tapeworms. But <laughs> this is the wisdom of their day. This is... they. They actually believe this, and we laugh at it, but then I wonder in 100 years what they're going to laugh at from us today, right? Um, and wisdom just seems to shift and to change, and we change our minds all the time about wisdom, yet what is wisdom? And so today I want to talk about wisdom because James talks about wisdom, and in his, this passage we're going to look at, uh, James begins with a question, and I think it's a, a pertinent question, and this is, we're going to jump right into James chapter 3, beginning of verse 13. He asks, who is wise and understanding among you? That's a great question, right? Who is wise and understanding? Anyone want to raise your hand? Oh, I, I don't know, you think that's a trick question? I'm just curious. Nobody raised their hand. Now, would you point to someone like, if you're like, yeah, I think they're wise and understanding, would you point, you don't have to point to them right now, but who, who would you think of? Maybe somebody with silver hair, hint, hint, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because like, like the idea that someone with silver hair, gray hair, they've experienced, they have some experience uh, to their age, and, and oftentimes that can produce wisdom, but you know, not always, Right? It's not just because you have gray hair or silver hair doesn't mean you have wisdom. That's why there's a, a statement that says, there is no fool like an old fool. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. <laughs> Perhaps you would point to someone who just knows a lot of information, right? Like if you're playing Jeopardy or some kind of trivia game, you're like, you want them on your team, right? Because they have a lot of the answers, Perhaps you would point to someone with a degree or two behind their name, right? Like they've worked really hard, they've learned a lot of information, and that definitely shows a level of smart. Or perhaps you would point to someone who gives you advice, someone who just, they're your go-to person, and they just have really helpful. And that, I, I, if that's you, let me know, because sometimes I just need some direction and, and some advice, right? But whether you raise your hand, which nobody did in the audience, or you point to someone that you think is wise and understanding, James says, that's fine. If that's you, that's fine. If you point to someone, but he said, let me clarify. If, if that's you, then let them show it. Let them show that they are wise. Let them show that they have understanding by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. 
James is like, this is kind of his theme, if you will. He keeps referring to this throughout the book. And I'm going to summarize it here just as a main point, that it's not just what you know, but what you do that makes a difference. Do you agree with that? If you do, you're agreeing with James. It's not just what you know, but what you do. This is not on your screen, but James chapter 1, verse 22, he said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. James 2, 17, Pastor Chris hit this last week, in the same way, faith, or two weeks ago, sorry, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So James isn't putting this emphasis on how we live our lives and saying that's very important. Now, I always want to give clarification, and Pastor Chris did this uh, two weeks ago as well, that James is not talking about a saving faith. We do not believe at this church, nor do we believe it's represented in the Bible, that we are saved because of our works. That's not what James is talking about. But because we are saved, God has called us to do good works. So the natural outflow of a saving faith that is based on grace and grace alone is to do good works. And that is what um, James is referring to. In other words, we're not working for our salvation, but because of it. Can I get an amen to that? Great. So this is really faith's most practical application. It's where the rubber hits the road. It's just, it's like as a Christian, as a believer, we say, I believe that God is a good God. I believe, and there's a lot behind that belief. I believe, therefore, I trust. I believe, and I'll just take our, our song. It just seems to be coming out of me today. I believe that God is at work, and therefore, I can trust him. Even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, let's just start singing again, woo, right? <laughs> I believe, therefore, I trust. I believe, therefore, I serve. Why do we serve? I believe that God calls us to serve. He's a good God. We represent him. I believe, therefore, I give. And that's why we say, I believe, therefore, I do. Okay? James is saying, go ahead and raise your hand and say, I'm wise. I'm understanding. Go ahead and point to people in your life. And James says, that's fine. Let that person, that wise person, show that they are wise by the deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And so in the following verses in this passage, James is going to talk about two kinds of wisdom and then contrast them with each other. He says, one is good, one is not so good. One is a wisdom that is from God. And quite frankly, he says, one is from the devil. But what's interesting to me is he refers to both of them as wisdom. And so notice that where wisdom is from matters. So I want you to pay attention. Where's the source of the wisdom? The source of what you believe, the source of what you trust in, the source of what you apply to your life. And depending on that source, that is going to affect the quality and the outcome of your life. And so we lean in. So let's go back to our verse, uh, verse 13, and we'll dive into this passage. He who, who is wise and understanding among you, let him show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So wisdom is a a key thing that James is going to talk about. He introduces the idea of how wisdom directs our life. And he just, in this verse, he just talks about wisdom categorically. It's just like all of it's there. But there is a wisdom which enables us to do good deeds and to live a good life. So let's dive in here. Now he wants to clarify which wisdom he's referring to. Verse 14. But, I love that. But if you harbor, and to give safe refuge to, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. So that word harbor, I'm just going to talk about some of these words that James chooses here because harbor, as we said, here's the, the actual definition. It's a sheltered part of a body of water, deep enough to provide anchorage for ships. The second idea there is a place of shelter or a refuge and a place of shelter or a lodging. So you get this idea that you've provided safety. You provided harbor to this emotion, if you will, called envy. And James is saying, don't allow envy nor selfish ambition to have a safe refuge in your hearts. 
That means if it's there, and sometimes it is. He, he says, don't deny it. Don't try to pretend it's not there. Just acknowledge it, but don't let it stay there. Treat it with contempt and get them out of your life as quickly as possible. Amen? So, but then let's talk about this. He uses this, this qualifier, bitter envy. And I have no, like I asked myself, why did he add the word bitter to envy? And the only reason I can come up with is the fact that if you're envious, and that's another way of saying jealous, a lot of times that affects relationships and that's just ugly, right? It's just bitter. It gets in the way of relationship. But I really don't know why he threw the word bitter in there, but the word envy means that it's an emotion which occurs when a person lacks another's quality, skill, or achievement, or possession, and either desires it or wishes that the other lacked it. Sometimes we just look and we just go, man, I wish I had what they have. And sometimes we know we can't have what they have and you just wish they didn't have it. And either way, it's not good, okay? And that's why I think he throws the word bitter in, in there with envy because it just taints relationships. But then he talks about selfish ambition. I think most of us understand what that is. Okay, and that's you're concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regards for others. It's basically ambition, which I think is a good thing. And I mean that in the sense of just having ambition to get out of bed, having ambition to work hard, having ambition to move forward but ambition which focuses entirely on oneself. James says that's not good. So how many of you agree these are not good qualities to drive your life? Do you? Okay, three? No, I'm just kidding. Wake up. It's all right. Wake up, get some coffee. Just kidding. Uh, These are, but these are normal things in our world, aren't they? It doesn't take long to look around to see envy and to see selfish ambition. Last week in my message, I you know, it was talking about James, the beginning part of James chapter three, where it says the tongue is a fire. And I made this statement that we are all born with a pilot light lit. And that's why I gave the example. We never have, if you're a parent, you never have to teach your children how to say mine. It's just in us. And so when you think about how selfish ambition can affect your life, or when you think about how selfish ambition can affect other people's life. James is saying, don't give that a safe place to grow. Don't allow it to direct and to lead your life. And don't pretend it's not there. So James's main point, he's saying, be aware if it is there, be aware how it affects your life and let's deal with it. But verse 15, he gets to this quickly. He says, such wisdom, and he puts it in quotes. I love that. Such wisdom. He's like, It's wisdom in the scope of this world, but it's not true wisdom. But such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. And that's the word. That's where I say it's of the devil, the source. Oh, I guess the NIV directly says of the devil, 1984. There we go. Come on. It's of the devil. It's demonic. And notice the source. He's saying this kind of wisdom is not from God. In digging a little bit further into uh, the meaning of verse 15, here's what one commentary describes as earthly, natural, and demonic wisdom. Here's what he says. This is not on your screen. It is limited to the present, the material world of time and space. By definition, it is restricted to things that man can theorize, discover, and accomplish by himself. It has no place for God or the things of God. It has no place for spiritual truth or illumination. It is a closed system of man's own making and choosing under satanic prompting. As James has noted, this wisdom is motivated by pride, selfish ambition, arrogance, self-centeredness, self-interest, and self-angredizement. If I said that word right. (laughs) It spawns a society whose watch, watch words are do your own thing, have it your way, and look out for number one. It pervades philosophy, education, politics, economics, sociology, psychology, and every other dimension and aspect of contemporary human life. It is not from God. James says, here's where it's from. 
It's from the pit of hell, it's from the devil, and it affects every aspect of your life. And then, I love what he says in verse 16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, if you ever stumble upon it in a relationship, if you ever stumble upon it in a church, if you ever stumble upon it in a government, wherever you have it, wherever you find it, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. Just think about, for a moment, families who embrace envy or jealousy and are only motivated for themselves. What do you, you don't have to answer this out loud, but what do you think that family dynamic is? What do you think about your company where there's envy and selfish ambition happening? Where you're not on the same team. You're on the same team, but you're not on the same team. Everybody's on their own team trying to do their own thing, trying to one-up. That's, that's a company that's destined for some problems. Same thing with the church. A church that if, if the, the body of the church, of people who are envious and jealous and, uh, and are just out for themselves, what do you think that church looks like? Governments. And in all those categories, really what gets hurt is relationships on every single level. I don't know about you, but when I read the book of James, it makes me ask the question, like, I wonder what kind of church did James attend? Like, what is he seeing? What is, like, who is he writing to? He's clearly calling out some people who do not live for the benefit of other people. He's calling out some selfish motives and people who are putting themselves first above Jesus, above others, above the mission of God. And James is like, listen, if you want to be wise, if you want to be understanding, great, the proof's in the pudding. Let them show it by their good deeds. Or let them show their fruit, the fruit of their lives. And when you contrast that kind of wisdom and that kind of person to what James is about to say, we get to verse 17, he says, but, here again, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then it's peace-loving, then it's considerate, it's submissive, it's full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. I love that. That's a cool list, isn't it? James is saying the person who lives with the wisdom that's from heaven has the benefit of other people in their minds as they live their lives. These aren't just good qualities, but show how to treat people. I mean, when you, when you think about um, these qualities of pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good for you, impartial, and sincere, these are relational qualities. These aren't just, just good qualities to have like we should, but if you have them, It shows in how you treat people. As you go back through verses in James, you can see how practical serving Jesus is to help other people. Let me just highlight a few. Chapter 127, he says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Chapter 2, verse 1, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. By the way, that sermon's coming next week. We went out of order, so just prepare yourself. Um, But uh, a good friend of mine, um, Pastor Rob Roy, is coming to share, and I'm very excited. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 15. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. This was in the context of faith without works, or faith without action is useless. Chapter 4, verses 11. We haven't preached on it yet, but he says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another again be careful how we speak and then all of chapter five it's just the summary says it best he warns about rich oppressors not cheating their workers like james is clearly concerned about how we treat one another in the church he clearly says we need to value people and i believe he's making a very strong and clear connection that god's wisdom is a wisdom that focuses on loving people, treating them well, and seeking reconciliation. Can I get an amen to that? 
That's what God's wisdom does in our life. This is the second kind of wisdom uh, which comes from heaven in contrast to a different kind of wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. But that list is amazing, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, merciful, fruitful, impartial, sincere. In fact, this list reminds me a lot of the list of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the same, but it's very similar. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In both lists, they're not only qualities that we need to seek after and to, to desire, but if we have them, they will definitely manifest primarily in how we treat the people around us. Like fruit, it can only grow when it is connected to the right source. I want to say that one more time. Like fruit, these character qualities, both the fruit of the Spirit and the list that James gives of the wisdom, can only grow when they are connected to the right source. Fruit is the natural outflow of the life-giving sap of the vine. It would be silly, but imagine it. If you had a fruit tree in your backyard and it was like, ah, <laughs> I don't know what a fruit tree would sound like, struggling to grow fruit, but you're like, what, what's going on? I'm just trying to grow fruit. It's just, then it's natural. It's normal. When the branches are connected into the vine, that's just the natural outflow is a fruitfulness. And this kind of wisdom that James is talking about can only come when we are connected to and receiving from the wisdom from heaven. And this is a, such a good reminder for even my life to make sure I'm connected to the right source. And that's my point of application. Make sure you are connected to the right source of wisdom. The reality is I've said several times that James is preaching to Christians. And many times, several times, just to be clear, he says, do not be deceived. And the reason he says don't be deceived is because we, even good, meaning, well, loving Christians have the potential of finding ourselves deceived. And if we are just not paying attention and going along with just the wisdom of the day, whatever sounds good, whatever is acceptable, whatever the world, all your coworkers, your neighbors says is the right thing and you want to fit in, you can find yourself deceived and leaning into the wrong source of wisdom. But if you lean in to the wisdom that's from heaven, man, what a difference that makes. So that's the question just for us to ask. Which wisdom are you leaning into? I have to admit too often in my life, I find, um, and we know, we, we're so good at like justification. If you need justification, it, you don't have to look far to find it. It may make no sense, but it's just like, I'm just gonna justify this. So I'm just, I'm, it makes sense to me. And that's my justification. The reality is there's so often that I find myself just going, yeah, that was more about me. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to convict us and just to get that out of our lives and come back to a heart of serving, a heart of loving, a heart of compassion, a heart that's seeking the benefit of other people, that's looking for peace wherever possible, that's looking for reconciliation. I remember this statement. I don't remember who said it when I was a young Christian. They said, sometimes it would be better for you to lose the argument in order to win the soul. And some of you want to win so bad, you will care less about where the soul will spend eternity just because you want to win the argument. And sometimes we have to be wrong to be right. And again, that's not an apply everywhere kind of situation. Sometimes we do have to stand up for truth. But if you understand the spirit of where you just lean into the Holy Spirit and you just go, is this a moment where I need to be a fool for Christ? where I need to have the wisdom of God and lean into that source. So what does it look like when we're connected to heavenly wisdom? 
I want to just leave you with two questions today, two questions to ask yourself, okay? Because I think they help us get a gauge of where we're leaning into. Number one, am I actively seeking God for insight and direction for my life? Am I actively seeking God for insight and direction for my life? You know, growing up in church, I heard this a lot. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. You need to fast. You need to have a quiet time with God. You need to show up to church. And, and oftentimes in my mind, I translate. I don't think it was their fault. I translated it as a checklist, as if I jump through the right hoops, if I do all the right things, then God loves me again, a very works-oriented type deal. And it took a long time, and I still have to question myself where I'm not just reading my Bible to go check. I'm good, right? What's the minimum? What's just enough to get by? But rather to say, God, I want to know you. God, I want your wisdom. I need your wisdom. This world is hard. This world is difficult. God, I'm just leaning in. God, would you just illuminate from your word truth? Would you illuminate wisdom that I can apply to my life? God, I'm praying. I'm connecting with other believers. I love church, not just, uh, not just for church sake, but because there's people there, because there's relationships. And I get to challenge and I get to be challenged. Do we care what God's opinion is on the subject of our life? If we read scripture and it is counter to what we want to do and it's convicting, do we care? Do we lean in? Do we apply that? Is his wisdom truly directing your life? See, James is trying to get us to see that God is a good God and has good things planned for our lives. Back in James chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, here's that statement. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who doesn't change like shifting shadows? God's not saying yes in one moment and then never mind, I changed my mind in another. He's consistent. He's faithful. He's a good God. And he has only good things for your life, including wisdom for you to live your life in the right way. It's a wisdom that will truly benefit your life. That God is the source for wise living. In Proverbs 4, verse 4 and 7, it's says, take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom. She will protect you, love her, and she will watch over you. He says, the beginning of wisdom is this, to get wisdom. <laughs> You're like, thank you. The beginning of wisdom is to get some. But here's the point. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. So am I leaning in to, the, to God's source of wisdom for my life? The second question is just the one of how that applies relations, relationally. Am I treating other, how am I treating other people? When your life is not about you, God gives you wisdom to make a difference in other, others' lives. We have to wake up with this perspective of, Lord, how can you use me? I'm available, Lord. And he might, he might go, I just need you to live your, your day. Just live your day. Just go through normal. It might seem boring, but just that's what I need from you. But as you're leaning in, as you're paying attention, you're also aware of those special God divine moments where you intersect with somebody else and your response and your conversation and your words and your demeanor matter and they make all the difference of how you're treating people. But when we come with that basis of, I'm a peacemaker, I'm about reconciliation, I'm gonna do everything in my power to treat you with goodness, with kindness, with gentleness, with respect, I'm impartial, I'm open, God, use my life. Amen? That happens when we're connected to heavenly wisdom. So those are the two questions. Am I actively seeking God for insight and direction for my life? And how am I treating people? Questions I think we all can ask on a regular basis and then make course correction. So I think James is saying, everybody check your fruit, check your fruit, check how you're living your life. 
When you are not liking the fruit that's coming out of you, just lean back into Jesus, lean into your source and reconnect to his life-giving supply for your lives. Would you stand with me this morning as we conclude in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, God, that you have a wisdom that you give freely. As James chapter one says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault. God, we know that you're a good God. And Lord, all of us, every single person in this room, we need wisdom. We need wisdom for our marriages. We need wisdom uh, if we're single for our dating life. We, if we're parents, we need wisdom to raise our kids. If we're a child, we need wisdom to take the next step and to, to honor our parents. Um, if we're a worker, we need wisdom uh, to, to support and be submissive to our bosses, Lord, and to represent you in every aspect of our lives. God, give us wisdom. We know the wisdom is not just gaining knowledge, but it's knowing to, what to do with that knowledge. It's applying that appropriately and treating people everywhere we encounter with respect. So help us, Lord. Help us to ask those questions and make course correction to make sure we are connected to the right source of wisdom for our lives. And we give you all the glory and praise. We ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being at North Creek Church. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. We're our guest speaker. On your, say hi to some people around you. And we have popcorn. If you have not already partaken, uh, grab some popcorn, spend some time in our courtyard, building some relationships. God bless you.